Well, we're going to get into it today with Dr. Peter McCullough. He is a cardiologist, chief scientific officer for the wellness company, expert on cardiovascular medicine with over 30 years of experience. He has spoken widely uh, on a number of topics, but he's very concerned about the mRNA vaccines. He co-authored The Courage to Face COVID-19, Preventing Hospitalization and Death While Battling the Biopharmaceutical Complex. That was just now removed from Amazon, which seems somewhat scandalous. PeterMcCulloughMD.com is where you can find out more. McCullough spelled M-C-C-U-L-L-O-U-G-H, PeterMcCullough.com. Twitter is P underscore McCullough MD, P underscore McCullough MD. Uh, and uh, of course, Dr. Kelly Victory is here with us. And I'm going to bring her in as early as possible because Dr. Vic Dr. McCullough has a heart out. So let's get to it. Our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. You have trouble, you can't stop and you want help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. I think everyone knows the next medical crisis could be just around the corner, whether it comes in the form of another pandemic or something much more routine like a tick bite. You and your family need to be prepared. That's where the wellness company comes in. You know the wellness company. We have their physicians on like Dr. McCullough frequently. The wellness company and their doctors are medical professionals you can trust. And their new medical emergency kits are the gold standard when it comes to keeping you safe and healthy. It's really, it's a safety net. It's an insurance policy yeah, absolutely. that you hope you're not going to need. But if you need it, you sure as heck are going to wish you had it if you need it. Be ready for anything. This medical emergency kit contains an assortment of life-saving medications, including ivermectin, z -Pak. The medical emergency kit provides a guidebook to aid in the safe use of all these life-saving medications. From anthrax to tick bites, to COVID-19, the wellness company's medical emergency kit is exactly what you need to have on hand to be prepared. Rest assured, knowing that you have emergency antibiotics, antivirals, and antiparasitics on hand to help you and your family stay safe from whatever life throws at you next. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. That is drdrew.com forward slash TWC to get 10% off today. Just click on that link. Let me uh, go right to it and get Dr. Peter McCullough in here. As I said, uh, P underscore McCullough MD and uh, PeterMcCullough.com for more information. But uh, Dr. McCullough, welcome to the program. Thank you. So uh, I, I like to stay abreast of the literature as it emerges. And uh, the New England Journal puts out an electronic version of the publication every week or every two weeks. And uh, I, I thought you might like this because it just came out, just literally during during the intro to the show. Uh, this is uh, one of the lead articles, and uh, it's framed this way. It's The article is named, Do Pandemics Ever End? And it says, as an opening paragraph, since pandemics are sociopolitical as well as epidemiological events, their end is determined not only by epidemiologic criteria, but by social, political, and ethical concerns. When did that happen to pandemic? When, when did an infectious disease outbreak become a socio-political anything? Obviously, impacts socio-political functioning, but determining a pandemic that mind blowing. It's true. Uh, you know, we're coming up on four years of the the pandemic years, if you will. It, it's spanning quite a distance in time. You know, the Spanish flu was about two years, and it finished. So many have conjectured what has made this one last so long. And and I agree with you, I, you know, some of it's just uh, contextual of, of what people um, think is going on and how it's presented to them in the media. We are in the midst of a very minor out outbreak now and it's led, is we have the most diverse uh, subvariant strains so far we've ever had in an outbreak. They typically have been mm. single strain or single subvariant strain outbreaks. It's, it's very, very diverse. Uh, the leaders are uh, EG5 and FL1.5, but now HB1 is coming up in third position. 
XBB 1.5, that was the original target of the most recent boosters. Uh, that one now is at 0%, according to the CDC nowcast as of September 22nd, 2023. And uh, let me interrupt so you, Peter. I want to hang, hang a lantern yeah. on that. The, the, I want to make sure people hear what you said because it could, could go past them. The booster is directed at XBB, and XBB is at 0%. So the question but, is, but does me, it have any collateral effect? And I saw some data on EG5, and it was like, oh, yeah, it seems to have some effect on that. Well, that's now almost gone, too. So what, what are we doing here with this booster? Well, well, yeah, there were 10 animals tested with the new, uh, you know, the new form of the vaccine, and it did raise the antibodies equally against um, XBB 1.5, which is now gone, and EG5, which is, I think, roughly about 20% of, of strains. But these antibody studies have not been valid surrogates of, of really providing immunity, that is, preventing anything in a human being so far. Uh, but uh, the point I was going to make is that uh, we still are at record pandemic lows in terms of hospitalizations and deaths. And despite cases being up a little bit, even unadjudicated hospitalizations and deaths at a record low. I personally haven't had a patient in the hospital, and, and I hear about cases and I treat them in my practice. I haven't had a patient in the hospital in over two years. Well, I know um, both you and Kelly are very skeptical of Paxlovid, but, my, but I've been using a lot of it to, to great effect in elderly patients, primarily where it's been approved. But my, my question is, why do none of the commentaries about the necessity of vaccine, particularly in middle age and young people, take into account the fact that we have treatments? We have molnupiravir, we have Paxlovid. For, forget the early treatment controversy. We have two really effective pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, whether you want to use them or not is a whole separate issue. Why does that never come into the conversation about these requirements for vaccine in population where the risk reward is reversed? where there's not much benefit to be derived and increasingly risk is being sort of, um, it's becoming more clear that there's a lot of risk there. So why are they pushing so hard? I can't get it. And then leaving treatment out of the equation entirely. I think the strategy from the very beginning was a vaccine only strategy. You can think vaccinated gets sick too, so they would need treatment. I've used plenty of Paxlovid as well as Molnupiravir. I, I incorporated them into the McCullough protocol uh, you know, as soon as they came out, I've actually used all the drugs. I'm very diverse. I'm not biased towards one drug or the other. I do have to say, I am very impressed with the performance of the viricidal nasal sprays and gargles. I, I think they really beat everything in the protocol. Dilute uh, iodine or uh, xylitol based colloidal silver, and then yep. scope and Listerine with yep. some iodine or xylitol. Th this is amazing how good they are. 17 trials, three large randomized trials. They drop PCR positivity very quickly. Uh, you know, they were the way to reduce spread of the illness. And, uh, and when yes. carried out, they reduced rates of hospitalization, need for oxygen. So it's, I, I think they're yes. very impressive. You never hear any public health messaging about nasal and oral hygiene. No, no that's right. Uh, we were an early promoter of the uh, betadine solution. It was actually worked out and studied by an ophthalmologist who lived in the Caribbean or something. And I spoke to the guy and he, we went over the data. It was, he was like, this is astonishing stuff. Why is no one getting behind it? And still nothing, nothing. It's true. You, you know, the theory is, is that the virus is in this, uh, this exponential replication phase and, and the sprays don't kill all the virion particles, but they kill enough so mucosal immunity can uh, protect against invasive disease. And it works for the common cold, works for influenza, should work for any next respiratory pandemic. Uh, you know, I didn't know about this before the pandemic. So a cold for me personally used to be three days of a sore throat, then, then three or four days of nasal congestion, and then a week to finish it up, be about a two week experience. And I have had colds now where I carry uh, an iodine-based spray and, and, and gargles. And I can tell you right now, I've reduced a common cold to about a day. Susan, you had to look into that. You, you, she's had multiple viral syndromes in the recent months. I have. You've been traveling a lot. I, strangely, have not had anything. She's worried that uh, that she and one of our sons are the, are the most vaccinated in our family, and they've had COVID the most and viral illnesses the most. 
uh, and and it used to be reverse when we were you know throughout our marriage. It goes away pretty quick. But though. I was the one with the weak immune system, and you were the one with the powerful one, and uh, now it's reversed. That's, That's why I'm coughing in the background. So, but uh, I want to get Dr. Victor in here as quickly as possible. But I I'm curious, Dr. McCullough. I we haven't really I don't remember we really chronicled this in the previous conversations we've had, but I'd like to know how your life has changed with all this. Hey, what were you doing before? And what are you doing now? How, how, how can people understand what has happened to you? I, don't, I think they see you now, and I don't think they understand the road you've traveled. And I'd like you to just sort of tell them that, that tale, if you would. Uh, I'm formerly a uh, you know, full professor of medicine. I uh, ascended the academic ranks. I'm former chief of cardiology at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. I was a chief academic scientific officer for the St. John Providence Health System, the biggest health ministry for Ascension Health. Uh, you know, I was I had moved to Texas to take care of my family, and and was in that sandwich year as a you know as a father looking after parents and children, and um, I had a very nice position at a major medical center uh, here in Dallas, and uh, you know at my very, I, you know, when COVID hit, I got a big research grant to study uh, how we could try to prevent it. I had an investigation of a drug application. The White House contacted me and you know, ask me for help, and then the U.S. Senate. So I got involved. But prior to COVID, uh, I was well known in my field. I was the most published person in the field of heart and kidney interactions. I published the textbook chapter in Braunwald's textbook of cardiology. I had my own textbook, Cardiorenal Medicine. I was the inaugural editor, editor of Cardiorenal Medicine and um, of reviews in cardiovascular medicine for decades. I had lectured all over the country. I'd lectured at the FDA, the EMA. I've been on data safety monitoring boards, New York Academy of Sciences. Uh, so I was well known in my field. I think in 2007, I was on C-SPAN for hours of, uh, for a congressional oversight hearing. Uh, but COVID brought me to a, being a role as a public figure. And what I couldn't understand is why other doctors didn't jump on board and try to help in treating patients and treatment still was undersubscribed all the way through. I know you were out there, I was out there, Kelly was out there, uh, but we were too few. And what we know in a paper by Verdkirk and colleagues is that the only people who ended up hospitalized or worse dying, and almost all the deaths occurred in the hospital, is because they were undertreated in the ambulatory phase of the, of the illness. Sure, of course, of course. That, that was the part that was shocking to me, that we, we, we really abandoned our post. I couldn't believe it. and I come to understand how many doctors are employees and the employer was giving them mandates and from on high and they were frozen. They were scared to death to do anything. Uh, speaking of the cardiorenal stuff, did you see, this is just a complete sidebar before I bring Dr. Victory in, that uh, there was a study today on renal effect of uh, Ozempic, of all things, and that the uh, renal metabolic syndrome, that this is a new category of metabolic syndrome, is was dramatically reduced by Mm -hmm. uh, this medication. Did you see that today? It was just, just today. It's true. They, the GLP, uh, GLP one active drugs, as well as the SGLT two inhibitors have been revolutionary. They improve both heart and kidney outcomes, uh, you know, cause weight loss by different mechanisms. So we're using these drugs very successfully in practice. That was the whole reason why that I was really pushing that cardio renal field. The hypothesis was if we did something that helps the kidneys, it would help the heart and vice versa. And it's really paid off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, hypertension and the whole metabolic process mm -hmm. of obesity, this is all tied together. And that they we're finally looking at it that way, which is important, I'd say. Right. Uh, not, not, I'm not recommending Ozambic. Anybody who accuses me of that, I'm saying it, it, if your doctor recommends it, there's some significant benefits to be derived. All right, let's us, let us get Dr. Victory uh, in here. Do you want to quickly, though, uh, review your catastrophe with Amazon? And then we'll have that as a setup to bring Dr. Victory in. We were shocked on September 29th when the first author of my book, John Leake, who, who is a best-selling full-time professional author, uh, found out that our book had been taken down from Amazon. The audiobook and the soft cover are self-published. So John and I self-published it through an Amazon publishing agreement. So there's a contract. Amazon uh, you know, certainly reviewed all the materials, all the chapters. It's very carefully curated, curated met all the criteria. And it had 18 months of five-star sales, courage to face COVID-19, preventing hospitalizations and deaths while battling the biopharmaceutical uh, um, complex. It's being looked at very carefully for a major motion picture. It's extremely well-written and un understandable because it's written by a professional author. 
Amazon struck it down on September 19th, claiming, I think really fraudulently, that it had offensive content. And now in a series of email exchanges, they will not tell us what they think is offensive. And because it's self-published, we can actually make a, make a change. It's very easy to do that. And they won't tell us what's offensive about it. They won't let it back up on Amazon. And this is unprecedented. You know, books are at a different standard than a Twitter account or a Facebook account. You know, books are work of literary art. And ours has been, out of all the COVID genre books, has been struck down uh, after 18 months of, of great success. In fact, the month before, Amazon had lowered the price but kept our royalties the same. They do that for very successful books that are selling well. Mm. So something's mm. happened and, and and nobody can explain it. Well, I, I've been saying from the beginning that the burning of the books were underway and it's happened in many, many different ways. And we should be, we should be extremely disturbed by this, much the way disturbed by the silencing and firing of professors. These were things that, that we pointed at in the 50s in the McCarthy area as the extraordinary excesses that should never, ever happen again. And here we are again, coming from a different direction. Well, all right. So Dr. Peter McCullough is with us. Uh, as I said, you can get, can you still, you can get the audio book, but can you get the book anymore? You can get the book on Barnes & Noble, as well as on the book website, couragetofacecovid.com. Okay. Uh, and it's uh, PeterMcCulloughMD.com for more information. And also the Twitter handles P, un P underscore MD. What's up? Uh, also, uh, you've been a big advocate for nat natokinase. I think we have an outtake from you from the uh, wellness company um, advocating the utility of that substance. Yeah, and, yeah uh, I have. I, you know, I've been uh, embroiled in this... Uh, medical quagmire of what to do with the, the burgeoning number of patients with long COVID syndrome and those who feel unwell after the vaccines. And every study seems to lead to the spike protein, that spine on the surface of the virus being the problem. The spike protein is not amenable to human enzymes breaking it down. After the infection alone, Bruce Patterson has shown the S1 segment stuck in CD16 positive monocytes for up to 15 months yep. after a severe infection. Yep. After the vaccines, yep. uh, uh, the S1 and the S2 segment are held in the pre-fusion confirmation, and they've been found circulating in the bloodstream free, as well as in tissues that are you, you know, inflamed and developing organ dysfunction. So the spike protein seems Crazy. to be the culprit. Uh, the Japanese the, again, the, uh, the, use... Go ahead. Yeah. Japanese. The Japanese use natto, which is a the breakdown product of soy fermentation by a bacteria Bacillus subtilis natto. Now they've been using it for its cardiovascular effects for about uh, you know at least several decades. They've been eating it for a thousand years. It's a natural thrombolytic, proteolytic enzyme, and uh, indeed natto kinase in a, in a paper by Obu, another one by Tanakawa, clearly break down the spike protein even in, in cell lysate and intact cell models. We don't have clinical data indicating what the outcomes are, but it's so attractive. We started working with it in our practice now for over a year, and we are seeing clinical benefit without having funding. Funding's going all around us to other problems, but without funding, uh, we're doing the best we can in our clinical practice. Now, uh, we've, in the last few months, added bromelain. Bromelain is a family of enzymes derived from the stems of pineapple, also shown in preclinical studies to break down the spike protein. Bromelain's an FDA-approved drug as an ointment uh, used in deep uh, tissue burns and wounds in 2022. So we know it has a medicinal effect. It is available orally as a capsule. And then lastly, we add curcumin, and curcumin needs to be aided in absorption, preferably with piperine, a derivative of, of black pepper. And curcumin actually has randomized trials in long COVID. So it actually is in human studies, reduces inflammatory factors. People in general feel better. So we have put together this triple combination in clinical practice. And I've published this now in the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons. It's on the European Commission preprint server. It's called base spike detoxification, base spike detoxification, meaning it's a base of treatment of which we can add other things. Uh, but we need to, uh, we have found in our practice, we have to commit to this for about three to 12 months for people with multiple episodes of COVID, multiple COVID vaccines, in order to mm. make headway in their syndrome. Dr. Peter McCullough, Dr. Kelly Victor will join us right after this. 
Fall is right around the corner, which means dry, flaky red skin from allergy season is coming with it. But the best way to take care of your skin is with our skincare secret, Genucel. You don't need to worry about that puffy, tired eye look or those annoying dark spots or even dry flaky skin because Genucel skincare has you covered. Susan and I love our Genucel products so much, we want you to try our personally curated skincare bundles. It's risk-free at genucel.com slash Drew. Genucel works so well, you can see the results in this unplanned live moment on our show when the Redness Repair Cream repaired my skin in just minutes right before your eyes. Their concentrated vitamin C serum helps keep your skin plump and hydrated. Plus, with their immediate effects, you can see astonishing results in under 12 hours. Quick, effective, and easy. Go to genucel.com slash Drew right now to try our bundles and save over 60% today. And remember to enroll in Genucel's world-class concierge program for additional savings and free shipping. Don't wait. It's genucel.com slash Drew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. These products have transformed my life and Susan's and saved her marriage. Discover the key to oral hygiene, regardless of your current daily dental routine. Whether you diligently brush and floss multiple times a day, or you struggle, you got bleeding gums, bad breath, plaque buildup, this revelation is for both of you. Surprisingly, over 350,000 Americans experience health issues that may be connected to their toothbrush or even caused by it, ranging from heart or blood sugar problems, forgetfulness, digestive difficulties, immune issues, all related to oral hygiene. Scientific studies have shown that a simple switch of your toothbrush can lead to a healthier teeth and potentially save your marriage. Yes. Save your marriage. Our study, we did a personal study. My wife, Susan, hates the sound of the sonic toothbrushes, but introducing the real white sonic toothbrush, of course, also their hydroxyapatite dirty mouth mineral toothpaste by Primal Life Organics, these products have transformed my life and Susan's and saved her marriage. It's much quieter. It's a very powerful toothbrush, but it is quiet and it saved our marriage. So, the Real White Sonic Toothbrush from Primal Life Organics stands out among all other electric toothbrushes I've tried. It effectively eliminates plaque, harmful bacteria, promotes gum health. Get yours and enjoy 60% off at naturaltoothbrush.com slash DREW. Some platforms have banned the discussion of controversial topics. If this episode ends here, the rest of the show is available at drdrew.tv. There's nothing in medicine that doesn't boil down to a risk-benefit calculation. It is the mandate of public health to consider the impact of any particular mitigation scheme on the entire population. This is uncharted territory, Drew. And Dr. Victory, I will cut you loose with Dr. McCullough. Just one second. My team here is very anxious to uh, tell people that if they are interested in the bromelain and the natokinase, it's available at drdrew.com slash TWC. Whoop, Susan's I here. think that they have the kids spike support that has the bromelain in it. I'm mm. ordering it because I like gummies. <laughs> okay. Well, All right. Listen, Dr. Drew, if I could just clarify, the kids yeah. spike support has both papain and bromelain, but in the pediatric appropriate doses, the uh, mm. adult spike support has natokinase uh, plus uh, uh, about a half a dozen minor ingredients that we think is helpful and the wellness company will be bringing on curcumin and uh, bromelain uh, in an adult trio so you can go to wellness company and meet your needs far and away the most important uh, element on the adult program is the spike support twc spike support two capsules twice a day and as you all know sure. we are sponsored by the wellness company but and you do two capsules twice a day susan's been taking the net yeah i've been taking it okay. only one i'll take two okay I keep getting COVID. Make sure, no. Susan, make sure between meals, between meals. Mm. Empty stomach. Because oh, it, really? Okay. It's an enzyme. It, it'll get uh, preoccupied with the food stream. Oh, that's good to know. Peter, Dr. Victory. Dr. Dr. McC Dr. McCullough, so happy to, to see you. Great to have you here. When I posted about you appearing on the show with us today, I used the uh, the words brilliant and indefatigable about you. And I mean, though, most sincerely, truly, um, I am so appreciative of your 
courage and leadership during this debacle. Um, I, who would have thought we'd be still talking about this four years later? Uh, but uh, happy that you're here. You and Drew covered a lot of territory before I came on, so I want to I want to go back to to a couple things and, and dig in a little deeper. One thing that you pointed out that I think has been underreported. Uh, and those people who don't know of pandemics, I am a student of pandemics, um, but people who don't know that, you pointed out most pandemics uh, are one single pathogen, one, not, not multiple variant after variant after variant after variant, the way that we are dealing with COVID, all of these strains that keep, talk about that and talk about why, what your theories are about why in the COVID pandemic, we are seeing such a huge and ongoing series of mutations and continuation of, of the disease process. You know, in 2020, I was the co-principal investigator for a national program for a vaccine. I was a vaccine co-principal investigator for the whole country. And it was a vaccine called the Imodulon vaccine. It was a cellular-based vaccine. And in our proposal, we said we would vaccinate only nursing home patients and nursing home workers, that we wouldn't over vaccinate the country because we were afraid of actually breeding resistant strains or causing you know, ecological pressures. Two papers uh, appeared, one by Neeson, the other one by Venkata Krishnan, uh, both showing if we got to more than 25% of the population vaccinated in a highly prevalent pandemic, we would put evolutionary pressures on the virus to have it basically to select for strains that are gonna be resistant to the vaccine or at least be able to you know, live in, in a vaccinated person easily. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, we did see outbreak after outbreak of, of single strains, right? So we had uh, the wild type, then alpha. We didn't really have a, a beta uh, here, but uh, it was in South Africa. Gamma was the worst, that was in the center part of Brazil, but we did have delta, uh, we did have alpha, we did have delta, and then, when Omicron came, this was interesting, December of 2021, it literally shut off Delta overnight. It closed the immunologic door. And there are two Japanese peer-reviewed papers suggesting that Omicron is so heavily mutated that it may have come out of a lab. And that's the conclusion. It may have come out of a bio lab. And that's the conclusion of you know independent Japanese investigators. Yeah, I think I think it's very clear in my estimation that the uh, that the vaccines were a significant contributor uh, to this ongoing mutations. Mm -hmm. There's a reason we have never launched a mass vaccination program in the middle of a pandemic. Um, that's sort of a, a, a fundamental construct of of pandemic management. So I wanted to make sure that we got that out there. Um, you posted something interesting uh, and something that I have said many times in the past, where I forced, you know, against my will, which is the only way it would be, that I would take one of these vaccines, I would have also gone for the Novavax, thinking it's the, uh, of all of the options out there, it's perhaps the the least bad, if that, uh, I, if I could say that'd be the least problematic. Talk a little bit about your thoughts about that vaccine versus uh, the mRNA vaccines. The mRNA vaccines, uh, you know, they code for the spike protein. And they originally coded for the original Wuhan strain, the BA4, BA5, uh, Omicron subvariant, now XBB 1.5. But they, there's no control over turning off the genetic code for the spike protein. There's no control over how much spike protein the body would get. Novavax is the only antigen-based vaccine has five micrograms of the spike protein, so it's fixed. So it's, it's like a tetanus shot, five micrograms. And I do think overall, looking at the data, that it's safer than the other vaccines, but it, unfortunately, it's terribly ineffective. I think I have that on my Substack today. Uh, just like the other vaccines, uh, the duration of coverage is very, very short. And uh, uh, you know, in, in most of the analysis, it doesn't even get fifty percent protection against any outcome. Yeah, and that's J &J I, I'm not when it was around. Just curious. What's that? You guys, uh, the Johnson and Johnson. Whether that's the one I took because I, I like the idea of a, of a traditional platform that had been well studied. Uh, of course, it had its problems. I was a I was a victim of some of it. But but I, I always had the sense that was not such a relative risk of that vaccine. There's my side effect. I had a sudden raccoon's eye, which is the presenting feature of a transverse sinus thrombosis, which is the dreaded complication of the J&J &J, and took it off the market because I think there were five cases or 10 cases or something. But in retrospect, 
I, maybe maybe not as deleterious and maybe efficacious as well. J and J and and of course the uh, outside of the United States the AstraZeneca vaccine or adenoviral vector vaccines uh, similar to the Sputnik vac or the uh, Russian vaccine I think it's called Sputnik and um, yes uh, uh, you know what they do is they uh, you know have a replication incompetent adenovirus and then it you know as it enters the cell it actually gives the code to produce the uh, the spike protein but again we found in J and J it was too much spike protein it was not uh, it was not reproducible, uh, too much thrombosis, even the vector uh, tripped off some thrombosis. And so AstraZeneca removed globally, uh, removed in the United States. AstraZeneca turned out to be about 6% of the U.S. Uh, population who took a vaccine took uh, Johnson Johnson and the rest took messenger RNA, less than 1% took Novavax. Yeah, my concern, I, I, I was saying about the Novavax is that I don't care if it's ineffective, if I was forced to take it only because I've been criticized in the past for saying that people who take the mRNA vaccines fundamentally become spike protein, you know, factories. That's what they are. Mm -hmm. There is no off switch. Uh, and I think it is extraordinarily problematic. Uh, so anyway, I was interested in your post about that. The, the but, big but thing I, I want to get I, into, go ahead. Yeah, but Kelly, I just wanted to point out, have you ever wondered why the CDC never really featured or HHS never really featured J&J &J or Novavax in their commercials or their promotional materials? Isn't that interesting? Oh, oh there's, well, yes, very, yeah. very interesting. I, I assume it's, I assume it has something to do with who owns the patents on those particular uh, <laughs> vaccines and who was making the money. Right. NIH co-owns the patent with Moderna. But interestingly, Pfizer and Moderna use the same marketing firm, Weber Shandwick. And Weber Shandwick has an installed marketing unit within the CDC. Their workers are in the CDC vaccine office promoting Pfizer and Moderna, preferentially over J&J &J and Novavax. So Americans never really got a fair look at the choice of vaccines. No, and as an aside, I know that you, you know my my uh, my friend Bobby Kennedy, and I know that you are uh, very close with him now too. Is really he's been um, very vocal about these issues. He said we had Bobby on the show a couple times, and I asked him specifically about how he would manage. Um, really, the conflicts of interest with regard to our, you know, there are once storied medical journals and the intrusion of big pharma into our medical journals. And interestingly, he said that if he were elected president, he would haul the editors of the big journals in and tell them if he they didn't disarticulate their relationship with the pharmaceutical companies, that he would file a RICO case. He would file racketeering uh, charges, which I thought was brilliant. Just as an aside, I thought because the the conflicts of interest, you're talking about a marketing firm being embedded within the CDC, that is so rotten, that is so corrupt that I I, I, I find myself apoplectic. I, I just, I, it's hard to to say just uh, what a raw deal Americans have gotten as, as a result of all of this. You know, Rand uh, Paul, Rand, Rand Paul wrote a letter to Walensky and said, listen, you've got Pfizer and, and Moderna's marketing unit inside the CDC. They're emailing each other about, you know, uh, creating, you know, trying to curry favor to uh, to the CDC. And it turns out Walensky and their unit, they paid fifty three million dollars to Weber Shandrick to get that marketing. So that's how corrupt it is. Money is just flowing in this biopharmaceutical complex that we describe in my now banned book on Amazon. Yeah, unbelievable. The, well, the, the big topic I really want to talk with you about um, it, it is this issue, and Drew and I have argued about it quite a bit, this issue about myocarditis and putting to bed once and for all the idea that COVID has just as much a risk of causing myocarditis or pericarditis as the vaccine does. Uh, our friend, our mutual friend and colleague, Ryan Cole, we've discussed this with him, and he has stated unequivocally that you are able to stain, if you did the appropriate staining of the myocardium, you would be able to differentiate between uh, spike proteins in the myocardium and the heart muscle that are a result of the vaccine versus those that would be the result from having had the virus. But let's talk, let's go down that road. Talk about what we know and what the studies have shown with regard to risk of myocardium 
myocarditis from having had COVID versus the vaccines. Okay, let's just talk before the vaccine. So we have a period of time before the vaccine, so we cannot implicate the vaccines. It's, it's just what we know. It actually goes back to 1992. Ralph Barrick published in the American Journal of Cardiology, a journal that I was the senior associate editor of, so I know it well. He published in 1992 that if we flood the, a, a, an animal heart in a, um, uh, you know, in a in vivo model with uh, beta coronavirus, we can cause some myocarditis. So with COVID, there was an a priori concern that COVID would cause myocarditis. So uh, we had screening programs for the NCA Big Ten, the U.S. military, and the Israeli military. And the U.S. Big Ten is most notable, published in JAMA by Daniels and colleagues. They screened thousands and thousands of athletes. In 2020, 30% of the Big Ten got COVID. So they went, they had uh, uh, biomarkers, troponin and others, EKG, imaging, cardiac MRI, and that huge screening program, they netted about 36 putative cases of possibly myocarditis. And there was no hospitalizations and deaths. It was completely inconsequential. Same thing with the US military and same thing with Israeli military. So they dropped it. So we know community outpatient COVID-19, uh, it's been well studied now, is not a significant cause of myocarditis. Two Valley and colleagues published in Israel an observational study showing in 2020, there was really no increase in myocarditis over the baseline. So where does this talking point come from? Even Fauci said this, that there's way more myocarditis from COVID than, than the vaccine. It comes from inpatient studies. So in 2020, in inpatient studies of COVID, about 30% of people in the ICU have an elevated troponin like they do with sepsis, with pneumococcal pneumonia and others. And that troponin elevation is triggering off an ICD code, which in big database yeah. studies is reading out as myocarditis. It's not adjudicated myocarditis. It's not confirmed by the Lake Louise criteria or anything else. And so it's a false claim that COVID itself causes significant myocarditis. Now enter in the vaccines and we have explosive numbers of cases, including you know, hospital, you know, many studies showing hospitalized and fatal cases of COVID vaccine myocarditis. Have you, so, did you so guys have terms, a chance to look at the, the circulation article that I circulated uh, amongst us? Did, there was, it's from July. Uh, it's a, it's a Hong Kong article. Did you guys have a chance to see it? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm you're looking incredulous. Yeah. You, you, Peter, you saw it and oh. it, it sort of yeah. took my breath away that it, it was, uh, showing essentially, I mean, just to summarize a, a good study, frankly, that about half of these young males with myocarditis, mild myocarditis had chronic a year later evidence of myocardial mm -hmm. injury and dysfunction, particularly in the right ventricle. Yeah, it, it's true. Actually, that paper from Taiwan, there was a paper um, uh, from Yale, uh, uh, Barmada showed this, that it's not clearing up uh, by MRIs by nine or 12 months. Now, it, I can tell you, small areas of late gadolinium enhancement can completely resolve. I've seen that in my clinical practice. It was shown in a paper long before COVID by Bruckman and colleagues from Germany that non-ischemic areas of late gadolinium enhancement can clearly repair. The heart can repair itself, less so with coronary artery disease and ischemia and infarction. But an important paper mm. by Yonker and colleagues from Massachusetts General Hospital, where they're hospitalizing kids with vaccine myocarditis, not with COVID, but with vaccine myocarditis, they found that the kids who have myocarditis have circulating spike protein in the blood and the library of antibodies is not neutralizing the spike protein, whereas the kids without myocarditis have spike protein, but the antibodies are appropriately neutralizing it. So it looks like why some get myocarditis and others has to do with a mismatch in the library of antibodies that's raised against the spike protein. I, I wanna make sure I'm hearing, so, I'm sorry, Jay, Kelly, to keep interrupting here, but, but the, are you saying that even though the gadolinium enhancement is still there a year out with stiff right ventricle, all that still has a high probability of resolving? Well, at a year, we start to worry that it's permanent. Uh, but we, there was right. two papers by Jenna Schauer and colleagues in the journal Pediatrics with uh, early on with kids with vaccine myocarditis, and these areas were resolving. The big ones uh, were resolving partially, small ones can completely resolve. Uh, you know, I've seen in my practice seven or 8% 
left uh, left ventricle LGE result. But shower in some of these kids, you, you know. A, by the way, a big area of damage is considered 15% of the left ventricle. Shower was mm. describing mm. cases where it's 25% of the ventricle damaged with the vaccine in the in the children she was uh, reporting in her papers. So I think a lot of this is the big areas are not going to completely resolve. Smaller ones will. Uh, by the way, myocarditis is treatable. The Japanese, well as myself, were using prolonged corticosteroids over three months, prednisone, colchicine for a mm. full year. Japanese are using IVIG or plasmapheresis. I haven't, I haven't had to do that. Mm. Those who have early heart failure, we use uh, uh, drugs like Entresto and Carvedilol. Uh, so myocarditis is, is treatable and it needs careful observation and they cannot go on the playing field. Even before COVID, when there's myocarditis, we cannot let them play because the surge of adrenaline could trigger a cardiac arrest the same surge of adrenaline, by the way, occurs about 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So you hear about uh, kids with myocarditis dying in their sleep, like the paper by Gill and colleagues. Uh, but the point is, uh, you, you know, the, the, the leagues were so concerned about myocarditis in 2020, they all had screening programs. Then we enter in the vaccines, right. and the FDA warns that they cause myocarditis by June of 2021, and none of the, none of the athletic leagues even screen for it. Right. So, so let me just clarify two, two things here. Um, part of my job on this show is to put things in lay terms. So what you were saying about the, th this myth, this, and it is a myth that COVID has, has higher risk of causing myocarditis as the vaccines. That myth was derived from the idea that these hospitalized patients who were very ill in the ICU had a blood test that would be elevated for anybody in the ICU with a serious infection or serious right. trauma, serious anything. And it was read out as myocarditis when they in fact didn't have myocarditis. And it is right. irrefutable at this point, the studies are clear that these cases of myocarditis are being caused by the vaccine, not by the virus. Um, the other thing it, that you it, just it, said that I think is, go ahead. Yeah, it's As true, say that the you, inpatient, uh, troponin elevation that kicks off an ICD code, uh, you know, those aren't adjudicated cases. Right. So they're not bona fide right. cases of, of myocarditis. And, and so this was very sloppily reported. Even the American College of Cardiology has a position paper in the fall of 2022 saying, oh, the illness causes uh, more myocarditis than the vaccines. So therefore, we should give vaccines and cause more myocarditis. It doesn't make any sense. Cardiologists would never support giving something that causes heart damage under any circumstances. Right. And, the, and then the other thing, and the elephant in the room, I will point out, you know, you, you made the point that the kids, children who ended up getting myocarditis had a mismatch between the antibodies that they have and the actual spike protein on the virus. If, if case people haven't connected the dots, the things most likely to give you that mismatch is having gotten a vaccine for a previous strain. And then you, know, you get it vaccinated for the original strain, for the Wuhan strain that they created. And then lo and behold, you get XBB. You're gonna have the wrong antibodies. You are going to have that mismatch, people. That's how it happens. Okay, you vaccinate people and then they end up getting a different strain. So I think that also the Thai study, if I recall, there was a study in Thailand of young males, I think 13 to 19 year olds, and they had proven that, I think it was about 300 kids, they had proven serologically that they had not had COVID, none of them had, they got the vaccine, and then I think 30% of them had EKG changes or evidence of cardiac injury following the vaccination. It was really a, um, I don't remember all the details of that study, but it was profound. Yeah. You're, you're citing that, you know, remember the FDA told Pfizer Moderna, you, they need to do prospective cohort studies where they measure everything at baseline, give the vaccine right. and measure everything again. Neither, neither company fulfilled that uh, obligation. It's one of the reasons why they're not fully licensed, but then neither one of the companies did. Mansugin uh, studied children aged 13 to 18 on the second shot of Pfizer only and did baseline blood biomarkers and imaging, including MRI, and then at follow-up, and about 30% had symptoms. However, the number that actually had met a definition of myocarditis using a multi-dimensional definition uh, in that study was 2.3%. And then separately, a paper by Buren and Lepesic in, in Basel, Switzerland, studied shot number three of Pfizer uh, in nurses, healthcare workers. And again, it turns out largely female. 
And the number there they got in terms of an elevation troponin and some other supportive data, the number they had uh, was 2.8%. So they're pretty close. So we think about 2.5% mm -hmm. of people do sustain some heart injury and less than half of that evokes any symptoms. So most people don't know right. that they're sustaining heart damage. What did you make, if anything, of at one point, the FAA changed the guidelines for the EKGs for pilots for the FAA exam. And I think it had to do with uh, loosening the um, the restrictions on with regard to PR intervals, I think, on their EKGs. They, they made some change, some substantive changes. Were you aware of that, that they, de they changed the cardiac guidelines of the EKGs for pilots? And what, if anything, did you make of that? I looked at it carefully. You know, the PR interval got the most press, but it turns out they loosened dozens and dozens of cardiovascular criteria, but also dozens of neurologic criteria. So the entire set of criterion for fit, fitness of a pilot uh, loosened. And my read on this is that I think it's actually due to the aging of the pilot population. Now, maybe superimposed because, you know, there's more disease related to COVID or the vaccines, but I don't think we can pinpoint it. Uh, but but any any way you evaluate it, it is now from a health perspective easier to have a commercial pilot license. Right, and and then the the last big thing I had on my, that I wanted to pick your brain about because I simply it is don't have a good handle on. People ask me all the time about this issue of shedding. Um, it, we, we, I don't, I, and I really don't know what the what the studies show. I really don't know that we've been able to prove it. What what is your understanding of the the risk of spike of vaccine shedding or spike shedding uh, with COVID? Yeah, I interviewed Helene Benoon, uh, who's former Inserm scientist. Now she's a you know independently uh, doing uh, review papers and scholarship in France, uh, a real expert on this and. You know, her belief is that there is bona fide shedding of spike protein, almost certainly, but it's probably immaterial. You know, uh, data from the Framingham Heart Study, UT Houston, a big study, shows 97% of us have antibodies against the spike protein. So it, it's almost irrelevant. We're getting some spike rechallenge, you know, orally, mucosally. It's, it's, it's not a big deal. The messenger RNA is a bigger deal. Now, two papers, one by Hannah and colleagues from uh, in JAMA, the other one recently in uh, from Japan in uh, Lancet, show that breast milk is carrying the messenger RNA. Th that's for mm -hmm. sure in freshly vaccinated mothers. A uh, paper by Castriuta and colleagues show uh, circulata circulatory messenger RNA for 30 days in blood. And now a paper by Crossan and colleagues from Massachusetts General Hospital shows the um, uh, the messenger RNA stuck in the human heart associated with inflammation at 30 days, uh, you know, in these deaths that have occurred within 30 days of the shot. So it's very possible that messenger RNA could be shed in body fluids, uh, certainly breast milk or sweat, what have you, within, let's say, 30 days of a vaccine, maybe 90 days to, to keep it safe. Uh, but, but there's never been a bona fide case demonstrating that demonstrating the transmission. There's never been a bona fide transfusion case of demonstrating that. And now uh, the Associated Press is reporting October 4th, 2023, only 1.3% of people are taking any more shots. So we're down to yeah. a tiny fraction to even study this now. For most people, the vaccines are long in the rear view mirror. Because I guess the question is, you know, if we, we know that you have the mRNA in breast milk, for example, and we can presume that you may have it in sweat or saliva or other bodily fluids, I guess the question is, you know, is there any indication that it can be absorbed that way? And the reason I make this segue is because we know now also very concerningly that they are injecting mRNA vaccines into the food source. You know, they're injecting, you know, beef and and poultry with mRNA vaccines. And so I guess the question becomes, is there a risk of us being able to absorb it through the GI tract? You know, can it be absorbed through the intestine or the stomach lining and those sorts of things? You know, what is the actual risk? Because this, I, I've said from the beginning of the pandemic that I believed that the goal was to make mRNA 
that word a household word to make people believe that this platform is tried and true and tested and nothing to be worried about and therefore we can just inject everything and everybody around us you know with mrna to to no you know concern you know what what do we know about whether or not you can absorb this stuff well i can tell you zhang and colleagues in the preprint server december 2022 demonstrated that a uh, rna for a restricted part of the spike protein, the receptor binding domain, uh, that could be stabilized in a exosome, essentially a milk bubble. And once they created this, they fed milk to a mammalian model three times, you know, fed it through the GI tract, and they were able to successfully immunize that mammal. Uh, now we have a, a, a press release that one of the companies has made a nasally absorbed messenger RNA vaccine. So I, I think it's becoming clear that, that the nasopharynx and the GI tract will absorb and take up messenger RNA. Um, the USDA on their website has multiple projects dealing with messenger RNA in the food supply. Now, some right. of these are to try to immunize the animals against disease and then in the plants, the goal of these projects is actually to immunize humans, trying to immunize humans against uh, diarrheal diseases or others through plants. Now, what's been absorbed? There's been one study demonstrating, I believe, watermelon juice. Uh, I think milk again will get it absorbed. They're going to find there's be different ways to get it absorbed. What's currently in the food supply? There's no messenger RNA that I'm aware of that's in the food supply right now. There are self-replicating RNAs, which are a little different. They replicate once and that's it. And that's in the uh, pork supply since 2017. And, you know, not all the farms use it, uh, but it is, you know, Merck's got a big sequavity program, for instance, and it's in, uh, it's in swine, not yet in beef or, or other products. Wow. All right. Well, I, I glanced, I glossed over, uh, not uh, purposely, your last statement, however, about the uh, decrease, significant decrease in vaccine uh, uptake or, or interest, you should say, that people just aren't doing. What is your sense of, um, about, you know, you and, and I and, and a few others have been uh, clamoring for these things to be removed entirely from the market? Uh, I, I'm thrilled that there's vaccine hesitancy as a result of everything we know, but that is not enough. They should be removed. We can't rely on the lay individual to, to know this information and stay away from them. Uh, what is your sense um, about whether or not these things will, in fact, be fully removed from the market? I don't think they're going to be removed. They are, uh, you know, they're presented by the Department of Defense and Health and Human Services. They are military countermeasures. The emergency has been dropped by the Biden administration in May of 2023. These aren't being dropped. Uh, this is what we describe in our book, this biopharmaceutical complex, the syndicate that's so powerful that they're going to continue these no matter what. You're right, they're announcing new messenger RNA vaccines. The U.S. government has made a massive investment in messenger RNA since 1985, paper by Lalani and colleagues summarized that. Um, you know, there's over 9,000 patents on messenger RNA, 9,000. Uh, the top wow. patent assignees are Sanofi, CureVac, uh, BioNTech, Moderna, and the U.S. government. So right. there's been a love affair with messenger RNA for the longest time. Yep. I don't think it's going away. Uh, you know, but there's no signs that it's becoming any safer. Carrico and Weissman just won the Nobel Prize because of pseudo-urogenation actually trying to make it last longer. Well, that would have been fine to replace a normal human protein like, you know, insulin and type 1 diabetes or aflagalactosidase and fabrase, but it's not okay when you're producing a potentially dangerous path, you know, antigen like the spike protein. Yeah, and, and it really begs the question. The the emergency has is officially over. Even you know Joe Biden has announced it. So so it really begs the question. There is not a single FDA approved vaccination for, and I use that term loosely, injection for COVID. Yet they are all available, and they keep cranking out new ones under emergency use authorization. How is that even? allowed? What's the emergency? We, we all have acknowledged that the emergency is over. How is it that they are getting away with continuing to push emergency use authorization, non-FDA approved injections? 
It's a military mechanism. It's a National Security Administration mechanism. I think the whole FDA part of this is just choreography. I don't think an FDA really has to approve or not approve an emergency use authorized product. I mean, this is the mechanism that's used to vaccinate the military for anthrax and small pox and other illnesses. So it's when our government apparatus decides that this countermeasure is going to be stopped. That's when it's going to be stopped. I think the FDA has nothing to do with it. I think that's the reason why there's a blind eye turned towards safety. The products are not bought and sold. Uh, do you know that guy out in Utah who was giving fake vaccines, who given saline right. injections? You know what his charge was? Disposal of government property. That's what these vaccines are. These vaccines are government property. They're not even considered commercial biopharmaceuticals. Wow. Wow. Well, I am cognizant of the clock winding down here, Drew. Um, yes. I, 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 yeah. You know, what What okay. have I not covered here? Um, no, I think you've done a nice job. I, the, the only thing I would raise is something that came up on our, our, stream, or our, our chat stream and Rumble Rant. And I don't know if this is even meaningful, but it came up a couple of times, which was um, somebody mentioned that you might have had a conversation with Damar Hamlin. And they were asking what happened in that conversation. Is that true, A? And B, is that something you can share about? I never had a conversation with Damar Hamlin, but I did pair up with another cardiologist, who both of us are very concerned. We wrote the Bills organization, we wrote the Buffalo Evening News, telling them that, listen, you know, athletes who have a cardiac arrest, no matter what the cause, the standard of care is to have a, a, an implanted defibrillator. And our great concern mm -hmm. is that he would be at risk for a repeat arrest. So, you know, our, our words were mm -hmm. transmitted and uh, we'll see. But but following DeMar Hamlin is very important because he is the first athlete ever to have a full-blown cardiac arrest, require defibrillation, return to the field, you know, ostensibly without without a defibrillator. And, and, and the other notable case is Oscar Cabrera Adamas, the Dominican player who uh, takes a vaccine, gets myocarditis, has a cardiac arrest on the court, declares that it's myocarditis, cardiac arrest, tries to recover over two years, He's on a medical treadmill, no ICD, and he dies on the treadmill trying to come back. That's two years after his original case of myocarditis. That's the concern about Hamlin. Yeah, and we've got yeah, uh, we've got uh, Bronny, Bronny. We've got Bronnie James, Drew, who who you're supposed to believe, you know, um, you know as well as I do, the amount of testing that these athletes go through before they are hired on by a uh, professional oh, yeah. team. They go through the ringer. So we're now supposed to believe that he had some previously undiagnosed, quote, congenital heart problem uh, that caused him to have a, uh, a cardiac arrest uh, in the middle of the of the court. Um, I think it's I think it's preposterous. I don't think it, it simply isn't plausible plausible in my mind um, that this could have been a congenital heart issue uh, that was, quote, overlooked in all of the testing that he had um, prior I'd to I'd like being, to know what it was. You know, what it, What is the, does he have right yeah. ventricular atresia or something? I mean, what does he have, number one? Well, number two, yeah, yeah, it's for people, that, that's go the ahead, other, Dr. That's McCall. the other thing. That there's never a statement of what people have. With Damar Hamlin, no one came out and actually said what he has. Hamlin's the one who had to give himself the diagnosis of commodial cortis. With Bronnie mm. James, um, you know, he probably had EKGs and echoes, I'd imagine. Uh, everything looked fine. He didn't have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's really what they're screening for. And then he has this near cardiac arrest. By the way, I don't think he had a full cardiac arrest because he was in and out of the ICU in hours. He was out of the hospital the next day. So I think he had a near miss and um, may have had maybe had some type of an arrhythmia. But uh, uh, he probably did undergo an MRI. They probably found a patent foramen ovale or atrial septal defect and said, aha, well, here's some previously undetected congenital heart disease. Now they have a storyline uh, in order to kind of take it away, but they don't mention, did he take the vaccine or not? Bronnie James went to a high school that strictly enforced all vaccines and everybody. Right. Then he goes to USC with strictly forces. And his dad says that it's the best thing to yeah. do to take the vaccine for him and his family in September of 2021. So almost certainly Bronnie took the vaccine. The case to watch is actually uh, Bronnie's teammate, um, uh, 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 Vince Uichuchu, he has a full-blown cardiac arrest. Again, USC, a vaccinating university, presumably took the vaccine. He gets an ICD, presumably an implantable ICD, and now he's back playing. Uh, so the, he's going to be an interesting, interesting case to watch. Wow. 
And wow. for people, that, uh, on these are these are little quarter-sized devices that go under the skin here in the clavicle area, and they prevent, they treat any significant cardiac events after that from then on. They can also function as pacemakers. But all right, Dr. McCullough, we've been very kind with your time. We've kept you beyond uh, where we should have. Thank you. Hopefully we'll talk to you again Thank soon. You. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. And uh, hey, Kelly, I'm going to chat with you for a few minutes here um, okay. after we let Dr. McCullough go. But Susan is... Uh, waving at me, doing literally doing like uh, jumping jack. So something is up. Okay, all right. So she's telling us we have to wrap up too. So uh, there's okay. other other obligations afoot. But I, I want to chat with you for just a minute. Did did you did you read that circulation article that I sent around? I, I, it really I, caught I did. My I just, I, I, I was. I, I scanned it because I was getting inundated with things to read before the show. Uh, our, Got it. Our, uh, take, know, take a Emily look. Take, take a look and see if you, so. if, but but see if you weren't as uh, blown away as I was. I mean, it's the first time where it's like, wow, this is very very <laughs> concerning, and and I'm. You know, I've been concerned right. about the myocarditis, but this really kind of took my breath away. And, and why it is not being discussed more widely is mysterious and almost makes me believe it must be over the target. It must be because it is well, it is uh, problematic. Yes, and and that's what I've been reporting on. And that's why I specifically, of all the things we want, I wanted to talk with Dr. McCullough about today, was I want to put to bed this this issue, this myth that you know, yes, we're seeing myocarditis, but a bunch of it's from COVID. That simply isn't the case. This is a significant yeah. risk from these vaccines. The the uh, big the pharmaceutical companies know it. The FDA knows it. The CDC knows it. Uh, it is out there. This is not a virus related thing. It is from the vaccine. And I do think it's very problematic. And I, you know, there are nuances of what Dr. McCullough said that I don't want people uh, to have missed, like yeah. the fact that there's a yeah. lot of myocarditis. The, the ones we know, Drew, are the ones that are symptomatic. When somebody has chest pain or shortness of breath or all of a sudden develops yep. exercise intolerance, then they get worked up. But it's the leagues of people who have myocarditis and don't know it because they don't have symptoms. Mm -hmm. And for many of those people, mm -hmm. the first sign that they have myocarditis is going to be a sudden cardiac arrest. The first yeah, sign that, that they have myocarditis sure. is going to be being found dead in bed by their parents in the morning. Okay. This is, yes. that's the concern. So the question is how many, you know, every, as far as I'm concerned, if you are a university that has mandated this vaccine, so you're mandating a vaccination for people who are in that prime risk category, they should be providing absolutely free screening for every single student that they have, the tens of thousands of them walking around their campus that they forced to get vaccinated, they should be forced to pay for the cardiac MRI for those guys, for every one of those students, for every employee who was forced against his or her will to take one, the employer should be obligated to pay for a full cardiac workup, including the very costly cardiac MRI to look for signs of myocarditis. I, I agree with everything you said, and not only that, but it, it isn't just the sudden death that now this circulation article implies. The circulation article implies that there will be lifelong progression of myocardial yeah. dysfunction, difficulty with activities, yeah. eventually cardiobiopathies, needing cardiac transplantation mm -hmm. if you're a young adult when developing these things. I mean, that's what this article implies, doesn't prove, implies mm -hmm. it. And that is gravely concerned to me. And I just want to make one last point, then we got to wrap this up, which is that there is a completely different diathesis of a physician giving something to a patient who is healthy and making them sick, as opposed to somebody who is sick and gets a medical complication. Let's say a myocarditis is common in the in the uh, COVID COVID uh, cases. It still is a very different ethical consideration. What it means when you have done harm, when your mandate is do no harm. And by the way, no. again, towards the push to get vaccinated, we have treatments. We have lots of treatments available now. So the push itself starts to make no sense. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you, and I will leave you with this thought. One of the great tragedies uh, in my lifetime in medicine is that they no longer even teach, Drew, the four pillars of medical ethics. Your average physician doesn't even know what they are. Uh, autonomy, mm -hmm. beneficence, non-malevolence, and justice. Everyone quotes first do no harm, and that is closely aligned with the uh, non-malevolence. Uh, but their beneficence, meaning you are required as a physician to be assured that what you are suggesting will benefit the patient, won't just not harm them, but will benefit them. In medical ethics, there is no such thing as taking one for the team. There is no such thing as being forced to take something against you know, your will or what's best for you because it's better for the rest of humanity. That is not a core pillar of medical ethics. And we have got to get back to that. You know, It starts with autonomy, which means that the, fundamentally the patient is always the person who is the arbiter of what is best for him or her. And it, it should have that ability to turn something down. But beneficence, the idea that you are obligated to be assured that you are doing something that is beneficial to the patient is different from non-malevolence, which is do no harm. You better be darn sure it actually helps, not hurts. Uh, and these are things that we have really taken leave of. And I find it uh, tragic that your average physician doesn't even know these things. And we had better, you can't follow the four pillars of medical ethics if you don't even know what the hell they are. I want to leave it at that. Uh, two, two final notes. I'm going to be uh, moderating a panel with RFK Jr. in San Jose on October 28th. We'll put up some information about that. Uh, and uh, yes, so I saw somebody just tweet there that tonight Teen Mom reunion is on the air. We'd appreciate your support on that as well. Kelly, thank you as all. Comedy Festival. And Comedy Festival on November 6th. Susan is yelling at me from the side. Kelly, we're still with you tomorrow with John Stockton. I'll see you then. Yes, at noon, earlier time. So everybody, noon, noon. tomorrow, Pacific, noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time with uh, John Stockton. Looking forward to it. There you go. And these are upcoming shows. Uh, Scott Adams, next Tuesday. Michael Turner, but Dr. Victory back next week. And Carrie Leak on the 19th. We'll see you tomorrow, noontime Pacific, 3 o'clock Eastern. Thanks. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. I remember like the first window to my addiction opening was when, so, you know, my, my grandfather would be in the bar all day and everybody would be smoking. And I always wanted to try a cigarette. And my mom, because I had asthma, my mom told me, if you ever try a cigarette, you'll die. So I remember being, you know, whatever I was, 11, 12. And I remember the first time where I was like, I'm going to risk my life. Like, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably die right now. Like, my friends are smoking cigarettes, like Marlboro Reds. And I took a pull of a cigarette. I got lightheaded. And I didn't die. And I was like, instantly, it was like, what else are they lying about? And it was like, right. let's the, go. Like, that, that, make that, the calls. Like, that that <laughs> is why you don't lie to your kids. Yeah, yes. It, interesting. How do you feel about Santa? You can you can tell them fibs and stories, but when they ask a question, you gotta you gotta tell them. I like that. I'm anti Santa. Yeah.